Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. We want you to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and you are fully loved by Him. You have been designed on purpose by God with unique gifts and passions in order to love and lead those around you. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, a pastor's wife, business owner, mom, and writer. And I'm Esther's co-host, Holly Kane. I'm a wife, mom, and business owner. I also write at hollycane.org, where I focus on my passion for women's ministry. Together, we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you, who lead in various roles, from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We are so glad you're here with us. You're listening to episode 65 of the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. This is the next episode in our friendship series, and today I'm talking with Noelle Rhodes about dealing with isolation in ministry and leadership. You'll hear us talk about her leadership journey, which includes a period of anxiety and depression, being called to missions work overseas but not having the support of her church leadership, and what she's learned about the problem of isolation as a leader. I love what Noelle shares about vulnerability, starting friendships, and even dealing with crisis situations as a leader. You're going to love this honest, real conversation with Noelle. If you'd like the show notes and all the links for what we discuss in this episode, head over to estherlittlefield.com slash episode 65. Now let's jump into our conversation. Hi, friends. I'm Esther Littlefield, and I am here today with my friend, Noelle Rhodes, and I'm super excited to talk with you today. Noelle, welcome to the show. Hey, I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. I feel like I feel like we've been friends forever. We're actually kind of new friends. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We're, and and pretty much online friends, but it's yes. fun to finally yeah. talk like this uh, <laughs> where we can see each other. So f- let's just get started, Noelle. Can you tell mm-hmm. our listeners a little bit about yourself and your family? Yeah. I am from New Jersey. I am a Jersey girl, born and bred and buttered here. And I have had the awesome privilege of living here most of my life, except for just a few years in Philly where I went to Bible college. And then I was a missionary to Northern Ireland with my little family for six years. And we just came back in 2015. I am married to my beloved, good-looking hillbilly Troy, who I talk a lot about. I talk about him tons on my podcast, and that's how I refer (laughs) to him, and he loves it. It's been approved. And I have two awesome, wild kids, Silas and Olive, who are preteens, and I'm loving this phase, loving the preteen phase, which I was very afraid of, to be honest with you. I've only heard scary things but this has been fun for us. So we're in a really fun, awesome season of our life. It hasn't always been that way. And we could talk more about that. But yeah, so we are church planting here in North Jersey. And, you know, we're just kind of seeing what God does. Sometimes the path is clear, but mostly it isn't. And we're in the mostly, it isn't hugely clear, but we're just kind of <laughs> be obedient. So yeah, yeah. I think so many people will resonate with that. And I know that's definitely been where I've been many times. So <laughs> we'll definitely, I'm excited to hear more about just all, all the things you just mentioned. Um, <laughs> but let's just go back in time. And can you tell me about your leadership journey? Maybe how you kind of figured out that you were a leader and the different steps along the way. Yeah. Well, I've always loved to have something to say. Even as a kid, I was one of those people that's like, you know, raising my hand or not raising my hand and just shouting out a thought that was in my brain. And I think that was sort of like the first sign that I wasn't afraid to lead in a sense. Um, but I really didn't realize I was a leader or wanted to even be a leader until probably the end of my high school years. And th- that was sort of the time where I really felt like Jesus was something I didn't really, I grew up in the church. So 
I talk about this a lot. I grew up in the church. My parents are first generation Christians. They got like wildly saved. Their testimony is like really interesting, Mm kind of saucy. And then there's me and I grew up in the church. It's like, oh, you know, I never raised my hand to like offer my testimony because it was never, you know, particularly sexy in that way. But uh, (laughs) I grew up in the church and always kind of saw Jesus as uncle Jesus, like somebody that my parents always talked about and he sounded really cool, but I didn't really truly know him for myself, but I kind of knew the practices, the cultural expectations of being a Christian. And I followed, I, I tried to follow that because deep down inside, I want everyone to like me. And this was the group of people that I was being raised in. Yeah. I have great parents, you know, but that was just kind of the byproduct of growing up churched. So by the time I got to my high school years, I was like, I think Jesus is kind of important. And I think maybe what I should do is become a pastor. And so I decided to go to Bible college and I married a youth pastor and I was really good at this pastoring thing because a lot Mm. of it was like planning events and feeling comfortable uh, talking in front of large groups of people. And those were actually very natural giftings for me, but it wasn't until I kind of had like a mental breakdown that I was like, wait a second, wait a second. I don't think I understand this Jesus at all. I need to like know Jesus, Jesus. And that was actually in the in the beginning of being a pastor, I started to have debilitating anxiety and depression that was kind of brought on by just that void of not really knowing who Jesus was. So I was operating out of like my natural gifts, but not really Mm -hmm. a place of understanding his great wild love for me. So, I mean, if you're in ministry, it's kind of hard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, it's glamorous for about a hot second, yeah. but you're on all the time. You know, you're never really done working unless you've you know, mastered boundaries pretty well, but mm-hmm. you know, it's very relational. It's very spiritual. So it's, it's ex- exhausting on every level. And so I really started to get, you know, I, I was mentally unwell and yeah. that was the time that really challenged me to to seek Jesus for myself. And through that pain and brokenness, I feel like God was turning me into a leader, but a way different leader than what I ever expected. And that was a moment that I felt like Jesus was saying, you're going to lead, but you're not going to lead because you're so strong. You're going to lead because you're such a mess and you're still with me and Mm -hmm. and I'm going to heal you and transform you. And you're going to honestly talk about that process with others so that they don't feel crazy and alone. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So much in there that I think could benefit everyone listening, but let's go back. So can you tell me like when in your journey did that moment come when you realized, okay, this is not working. I'm, I'm not, I can't do this without knowing Jesus. Was that before you ended up in Northern Ireland? Cause I want to talk about that too. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is actually really interesting. So a little bit before I had my first child, Silas, I started to feel anxious and depressed, but I didn't want really to do anything about it. And then it yeah. compounded and it got worse and worse to the point where I actually was blacking out from panic attacks. It was bad. It was like, it was one of those things where I felt like, you know, the, my, the church leadership was like, we're going to pray for you, but you should go see a psychiatrist. Like, mm. they were like it's at that level. Yeah. And I did, yeah. I went and got the right help and all that stuff. But what mm. happened was I had my son Silas, which brought on postpartum depression, which is a very real thing. Yeah. And it's not super talked about in the church because it's sort of like, you should be happy. Children Mm -hmm. are blessing from the Lord. You shouldn't be stressed, have faith. And I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And so I really struggled. It was really hard for me. And then when he was about one, I found out that I was pregnant again. And I, what, should have been like a joyful time, like was like the worst news I could ever. Mm. I mean, even my husband who loves a challenge, he's kind of like one of those crazy adventurous people. Yeah. He was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Like he was like, kind of yeah. like trying to like, <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. He was yeah. trying to like get me excited about it, but even yeah. he was like, this, this isn't good. Yeah. And those nine months were so hard for me. I really, I felt 
so anxious all the time. I was starting to actually become paranoid and mm-hmm. just, it was very chemical too. I want to kind mm-hmm. of just say it wasn't all spiritual yeah. or emotional. There was a chemical thing happening actually yeah. in my body. Right. Child, you know. Oh uh, yeah. That affects our hormones for sure. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. um, so it was sort of during that time, I was like, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And it got so bad in my third trimester. That was when I was like, I'm going to go see a, a psychiatrist and see if they can put me on medication because mm-hmm. I got to be able to get through this. Yeah. And they were like, Mrs. Rhodes, this, we could have put you on medication earlier on. I mean, this is back, we're going back like a decade. So I don't yeah. know what they do yeah. nowadays, but a decade, they're like, we can't do this now. It will actually affect your baby. Mm-hmm. So if you want to take that chance, we'll do it. And you don't tell an anxious person. Here's some medication that might like impact your child's lung development. They're right. not going to take it. So they're like, or we'll just do cognitive cognitive therapy. So I decided to go that route. But I was like, I'm going to need like some sort of like spiritual encounter with the Lord because I'm not going to make it. Yeah. And that was the moment that I was like, I have a I have the wrong idea of Jesus. He has been Uncle Jesus for 26 years. Mm. I need the Jesus Jesus. And so I went on a journey. And I had a lot of really great friends at that time that prayed with me and encouraged me. And truly, when Olive, my daughter, was born, by the way, her name, Olive, I really felt like the Lord gave it to me. When I found out I was pregnant, I felt like the Lord said to me, just like you know, Noah's on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights, you're going to be pregnant for 40 weeks, it's going to be tough, and it's yeah. going to be crazy, and you're going to feel like, what am I getting off this ship? But at the end, there's a promise. Mm. And so we named her Olive because of that, because Noah, you know, sent out the, yeah. the, the, the dove and it came back with the olive branch. So, um, yeah. So when she was born, like physically, when I gave birth to her, I actually could feel just joy and peace. And mm. I know it wasn't just the hormones leaving. It was, yeah. it was, it was like God, you know? And she was the most colicky baby you've ever met in your life. I mean, she's still, she was born with something to say too. And yeah. <laughs> like at birth, she was like, I don't like it here. It's too cold. Get me back in. <laughs> she um, was challenging, yeah. but I knew it was the Lord because I was seeking him and I wasn't afraid. I wasn't anxious. So f- for someone who had postpartum depression, having a colicky baby is like, could be bad, you know, it could be a bad combo, but Mm -hmm. I just had so much joy and peace. I think that really, that whole experience was the moment that was like, I need something beyond just church experience. I need like a real deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. And it's scary to actually say that out loud when you've been, at that point I was doing ministry for six years. Yeah. And I felt like a counterfeit. I felt like a hypocrite. And honestly, it probably was honest. You know, I'm going to be real. Yeah. But sometimes you have to just go on that journey and God, he uses everything to bring us to where he is. So yeah. if anyone's feeling that way right now, like, man, I kind of feel that way. I feel like I'm kind of just going through the motions. I don't have my own deep, intimate connection with Jesus. I just want to encourage you. It's okay. Yeah. Just start now. Mm-hmm. It's never too late. You don't have to keep faking it anymore. It's all right. We've all been there. Yeah. So, yeah. I answered that question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, wh- when you were going through the, you know, the time of depression and the time of just these, these panic attacks and all of that, how did you feel in terms of who you could talk to? Like, did you feel like that was something you could share with other people since you were one of the leaders in your church? And I'm curious because I know, yeah. you know, again, kind of depends on where you are and what church you're in, but curious how that played out for you. No. In the beginning, that's why I hid it. Mm-hmm. There came a point where I couldn't hide it anymore. Like it wasn't a choice that people knew because it was yeah. so evident. But I think I think that I knew of other church leaders who may have had spouses who had some mental illness, but I never felt like it was safe enough to tell anybody that I was struggling because I was afraid I might lose my job. Yep. That was probably the bottom line was if they find out that I'm literally going into my bedroom closet and crying in my bedroom closet because I'm so afraid, 
they're going to fire me as the youth pastor. So I would like on a Wednesday or I think at that time our youth group was on a Tuesday night, I would go and preach on Tuesday night, come back to my house, have held it together mm-hmm. and then go into the, we had a big closet and I would like, like cry. Sometimes I was so upset. I would like involuntarily throw up, but mm-hmm. nobody knew because I was terrified they would fire me. Now, nobody would ever, I, they didn't do that. In fact, I have to, I have to honor this church and say that they actually paid for my counseling, Wow, which is amazing. Yeah. But I myself did not think, it, I thought it would disqualify me. Yeah. So no, yeah. yeah. And I think that's how a lot of of us in ministry feel. It's a self-imposed limitation that we put on ourselves based on maybe how we grew up or the yes. impression that we have that people will perceive us to mm-hmm. be less than or to be unqualified, like you said. What about in your marriage? How did it affect your marriage during that time? Oh, my gosh. That was hard. And then, of course, that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, first of all, my husband has no he does not struggle with anxiety at all. He's very fearless to the point where it can be kind of annoying. You know, he's just not, he does have this unique, I believe, spiritual gift of faith that is is incredible. It attracted me to him. And then when we got married, I was like, this is really hard to live with because he would be like, let's, you know, he just trusted God so much. And I really didn't. And yeah. so he would see me like, be so consumed with fear. And he was like, what's wrong with you? And it wasn't that he wasn't compassionate. He just had no understanding for it. And so it was very challenging. And then of course, it was during a time where we were raising tiny little babies Mm -hmm. and he was also in ministry too. So he was trying to be a pastor, be a dad, take care of some stuff that I couldn't take care of. It was really, really hard. He was so faithful and so there for me, but it, I can, the actual, our marriage, like I felt like there, there was distance emotionally because it just couldn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So we, I have to say, Troy was really good about being like, we need to talk to somebody about this. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And throughout our entire marriage, we have sought out counseling sometimes because something has come up or sometimes we just need a little check-in, a little like preventative relational help so that we're on the right track but he's always been very open to that and I'm I'm that's a blessing cuz not everybody's okay with that but it was yep. tough and he was much more apt to be honest about what was going on than I was in fact if I found out that he like you know in a leadership meeting was like hey can you pray for us we're going through a hard time I'd be like what did you do like don't tell anybody that because they're going to go back and they're going to tell their wives and they're going to talk about me and then I'm going to lose the job as the youth pastor because or the kids pastor wherever I was at the time yeah. I've worn many, many hats but <laughs> you know what I'm saying like yeah. I was much more afraid and he was like who cares he's yeah. always been kind of like I don't really care what people think so that was an interesting dynamic between us and we've grown so much and we've had opportunities since then to counsel people who are going, who have gone through a very similar situation. And Troy has been able to really encourage husbands who, whose wives are really going through postpartum depression or extreme anxiety and being like, Hey dude, I understand the frustration. Here's what I learned in the process. So, Mm -hmm. you know, God uses everything, but you know, if you asked me 10 years ago, Oh, you know, don't worry about this. Think about what it'll be like when God uses it. I've been like, no, thank you. Right. <laughs> Does no, not you. feel good in in no. when it's happening, no matter what the trial is. No. Oh man. So let's go forward to when you you had this moment. Your daughter was born, mm-hmm. and kind of you've said you felt that just that joy and peace come over you, and then you started to connect with the real Jesus. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you tell us like what are some of the things that you did? after that, that, that helped you to really get to know Jesus in, in a real way, instead of just playing church kind of like you'd been doing before. So I started to read my Bible, not just to prepare a message. So I started to read it every day. A funny thing happened though. I feel like the Lord kind of knows us so well that he, he allows specific circumstances to take place that will sort of force us to grow in our relationship with him. Two weeks after my daughter was born, 
the church manse that we were living in caught on fire. The long story. <laughs> we had to like evacuate before it like literally caught on fire. Oh my goodness. And we uh, lost a lot of our possessions. We were fine, like physically. Yeah. And so what happened was my husband was like, well, we, you know, we're gonna have to live with your parents for a little bit to figure out what's next. And I said to him, so like, are we going to buy a house? Cause this time we were living in a church man. So it was kind of part of our salary package, all that stuff. And he was like, no, I think we should move to Northern Ireland to be missionaries. And he is, he had always had a heart for Northern Ireland. He had been in a an intern working with an organization when he was in college there. So he had a connection. And I also had had an interest for it as well. And I knew something was different in me because I was like, okay. And normally the old Noel would have been like, you're crazy. Yeah. We we have two babies right now. Uh, Just about a month ago, I was losing my ever-loving mind. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. (laughs) So even I think I think even Troy was like this must be Jesus. However, what happened was the church we were working for at the time, the leadership there was not particularly thrilled that we wanted to leave to be missionaries, mm. and it was very awkward. Yeah, to put it lightly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've talked about this publicly since, but it was not a great time. Mm-hmm. And it became very difficult. And there was sort of this sentiment that maybe we were doing something wrong because we were going against our church authority who felt like we needed to stay and keep doing what we were doing. And then it kind of, it just didn't, it did not go well. And so what that happened was I had to really listen to the Lord for myself in the past, I would have taken my cues by whatever my church leadership felt. So I would have said, oh, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? And if they said yes, I would have been like, must be God. And if they said no, I would have been like, it must be God. But here I really felt like God was calling us to Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. I had peace about that. I felt like he was speaking that to me through his word. And the fact that we had no more possessions, we were we were willing to go. We were at a time of our life where we just felt ready. It was it was just the right time. And then my church leadership was saying, "No, you can't go. You n- absolutely not. And if you do this, you're doing this against our council." Well, people pleasing Noel from the past mm-hmm. would have been like, "I guess we're not going." So it, it really forced me to seek him for myself and go, "Lord, are you? Because you, you and our church leadership are not saying the same thing. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm crazy and like hearing this the wrong way, you got to make it clear. And for like a year and a half, it was living in that tension. My husband, again, very has just this unique gift of just knowing when God says when God tells him to do something, he just like this kind of stuff. He just does it. And it takes me a long time to catch up. I want all the confirmations. I want all the sign, and I want everybody to be into it too. And so, it really was a challenge because mm-hmm. the people that I wanted approval from weren't not giving me the approval. So that year and a half was like that was when I really discovered Jesus, Jesus, because nobody was giving me approval except Him. Yeah, nobody was 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 encouraging me in that sense, except him. There were a few people, I mean, I have to say, there were a few people that did, they were like, they supported us, they um, were for us, but it was hard. I mean, it was a very painful time. So that was sort of that moment, that that time frame where I believe God was really like, okay, I'm going to put you in a situation where only you're only going to be able to hear from me yeah. so that you know. And the interesting thing about that was, because the church leadership w- weren't particularly for us going, um, we weren't able to really fundraise within our church. We had like no money. I mean, like, <laughs> it was, like looking back, it was, we were the, the most dumbest like missionaries in <laughs> the world. We were like rogue missionaries going kind of like on our own. I would never recommend that, by the way. Just yeah. Just listening, unless God's clear. But right. um, we had no money. And 
we we're like, I think we we're like two months, one month out from when we we're supposed to leave. And I was like, Troy, what should we do? Like, we've no, like, we had like, you know, a couple thousand yeah. dollars, but like, listen, we're moving with no. children to Northern yeah. Ireland, where at the time the pound was like equivalent to two American dollars. So we were like, and it was, there was, it was awful. So anyways, he's like, well, let's just like trust God and go ahead and apply for our visas. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and so we did. And then like the Lord just moved on someone's heart to send us a really big check in the mail. I mean, it was like Ooh. crazy. And I felt like at that moment, God was saying, look, you are going to know that I'm sending you to Northern Ireland. I am calling you. It's not because this group of people are behind you and cheering you on and are going, well, and Troy, you're awesome. They're going to do amazing things in Northern Ireland. Right. It was like nobody was for us. <laughs> and this person wanted to be anonymous. So we couldn't even like tell people. Oh, wow. But it was so, that was a huge shift for me because I felt like the Lord was saying, you got to listen to me. And when you do, I'm going to provide for you. And you're not going to be alone. And I'm going to send you people, but it may not be the people that you are thinking. So it was just really, really a cool, it was just a cool time for us, Mm -hmm. but really painful. Yeah. Yeah. It it seems like sometimes when God calls us into something new, it's, it's that he's asking us to do it. And then he's like, and do you trust me to to be there? Right. Because that that's really what it boils down to is trust. And it sounds like that's what your husband has um, <laughs> has yes. a special gift for is just to be like, yeah, God's got it. God's going to do this thing. Oh, so yeah. many fights about that, so. though. <laughs> I'm like, yes, he's got it, but I'm still freaking out. But let's yeah. also be smart. I mean, that's me. I'm always like, yes. well, let's just be smart about this, too, though. <laughs> like, God gives us brains to use our brains. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I have a line that I say that drives him nuts. And I say, Jesus came to take away our sins, not our brains. <laughs> And he, I, that's not original to me, by the way. I heard okay. someone say that. But in our fights, I'm like, you know. And he's like, don't say it. Don't say that Jesus came to take away your sins and not our brains. But it's true. You do have to have wisdom. But there yes. are moments where you are going against your 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 natural better judgment, so to speak, yeah. knowing that it's faith. Right. You know? So because yeah. yeah, because God often will do things that are outside of our our own ability mm-hmm. to figure something out. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So tell us about your experience in Northern Ireland. And I'm curious to know if there's any, you know, leadership lessons that you learned during your time there. Oh, yes. So I went to Northern Ireland. <laughs> and when we moved there, it was it was pretty cool. We were there for about two and a half years. And unfortunately, things started to fall apart in the organization and church that we were working for. And we had to effectively shut down the church and the organization, Mm. which was very messy and horrible. Another really painful, terrible experience. Again, ministry is, can be brutal. And so at that point I was kind of like, let's just go back home and like work at Starbucks for a little bit. And Mm -hmm. also during that time, our son we were going through this thing with our son who wasn't speaking. Hmm. He wasn't academically progressing. They weren't sure what was going on with him. They thought maybe he was autistic and then he, and then he wasn't autistic that, you know, he wasn't being diagnosed with autism. Yeah. So we were living in this chronic uncertainty, what's going on with our son, what's going on with this church that we moved our life for. Right. It was really spiritually terrible too, because we were lonely and we were so lonely. And there were certain things that we had to handle and deal with that we couldn't openly speak about or even tell other people because it involved other people's stories or even just who would get it, like who would understand this particular situation. So we felt really lonely. And that was another time where I felt like the Lord really, um, at that time I was studying the life of David. And I remember just, you know, how David was on the run from Saul before he became king and just the time that he was in the caves and just just how David had to constantly inquire of the Lord as to what to do. And God always God always led him when he did. And so that was sort of a season where I learned that. I didn't know what to do sometimes and I felt helpless and I felt angry and I felt lonely. 
And though I wasn't struggling with that depression and anxiety anymore, I was sort of feeling like, what the heck, Lord? I mean, we're mm. left everything for, for this to not be successful. And I think that was a time where God really smashed my idea of what ministry success looked like. I thought ministry success was, I'm going to come and like save Northern Ireland, first of all. <laughs> that was like the extent of my pride. And then yeah. I also thought, I'm going to go work with this little church. And then we're going to be, you know, a part of it growing and becoming huge. And there's thousands of people and there's revival and all this stuff. And then like the opposite happened. Mm. And the Lord was just like redefining to me what it looks like to really truly work in the kingdom of God. And it was, again, humbling very humbling. I had to really learn that it wasn't about me and it was about abiding in him. And then the fruit comes, but the fruit doesn't always look like numbers. The fruit looks like integrity Mm -hmm. and honesty and healing. And so it was, it was, it was difficult. And what happened was we closed down the church and we were invited to move to another city in Northern Ireland and work with the church there. And we worked with a church called Cornerstone and it was really some of the best years of ministry that we ever had. You know, it was almost like the Lord was just, he was really nice to us. Let's put it that way. I felt like he was like <laughs> kind of tough for a little bit. Yeah, come to, yeah. Come to these people. Get some relief. And, yeah. So it was a great time. Uh, those people really loved our kids. So they, I mean, it was pretty amazing. I, I we kind of talk about it like as a, the good old days. Macklemore has a song called the, you know, I wish someone told me these were the good old days. Mm. I, that's how I feel about Derry and Cornerstone City Church. And we went there and it was there that just because we had a move, it was almost like we moved to a different state. That's how the counties work there, yeah. the yeah. different kind of ways that they do healthcare. And so we had to have Silas, our son, tested again. And the they were able to test him to, to realize that he actually was hearing impaired. Now we kind of knew that already. He kept on failing his hearing tests in the city that we were at before, but it's a long story. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we were never able to get him diagnosed and finally moved to Derry. And they're like, oh yeah, he's hearing impaired. And he got wow. hearing aids and he got the help he needed. And it was like, he, I mean, he started to speak. I mean, he was seven years old and he wasn't speaking and his oh vocabulary grew. So in many ways that mirrored what God was doing in us because it was like, it was a season of fruit and we worked with this church and it was, it wasn't always easy, but there wasn't that kind of turmoil that we were experiencing before. And that was um, a time too, where we were working. We first moved to Derry. There was another American missionary family working in the same church, the Inmans, and they really took us under their wing and befriended us. And I got to say, I don't, you know, it's kind of funny, like American missionaries are not always super friendly to each other. I know it sounds terrible to say, but sometimes you meet like another American missionary and you're like, oh, so you're doing the same thing I'm doing, you know, but they were not at all competitive. They were not at all. They were just awesome. And they just like took us under their wing and loved us and like kept pushing us forward and just... Uh, Lori and Tim Inman. And that was really crucial. They kind of became mentors in a sense and just taught us how to love a country that wasn't our own. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much during that time. And I learned what it, what it means to be a leader. Mm-hmm. I love it. So Noel, tell me what, what, how do you define leadership? Oh, I think leadership is being willing to let others watch your life. Mm -hmm. And a good leader will continually say, look, look at me, not because I have the answer, but because I'm following the answer. You know, Jesus is the good shepherd. And I think sometimes as a leader, particularly if you're leading a church or Christian organization, you may say, well, I'm a shepherd, I'm shepherding these people, but you got to remember you're you're a sheep. Yeah. You are maybe a sheep that is closely walking with the Lord or is trying to keep your eyes on him. And you're allowing people to come, you know, come along with me. I, I'm, I'm listening too, but you're also a sheep and you're, 
you're susceptible to what everybody else is. And I think it's really important to just say leadership is allowing others to look at your life and, and to be an example, but not in the sense that you get it all right. I mean, recently I asked my daughter if it was okay to share the story, but recently she won the character award at her school. And we were like super excited. You know, anytime your kid wins something like that, you're like, well, clearly we're good parents. We're doing good. (laughs) Yeah. And so we were kind of excited about it. And I didn't get to go to the reception that they had where all the kids got, you know, like a bagel or something. And (laughs) I mean, it was very cute. And so I was asking her about it afterwards and she was kind of being funny about it, you know, like, she's like, yeah, okay. And then we got, we pulled up to the driveway and she burst out into tears. And she said, mom, I got to tell you something. And I said, what happened? She goes, I don't deserve this award. And I said, why? She goes, well, two days ago, somebody in my class was being annoying and I started shouting and yelling at them. And my teacher said that that wasn't very kind. And in that moment, you know, I felt like God gave me the words because, you know, this is not something natural in me. I would have reacted probably like, what do you mean you're yelling at them? And what did the person do? And I said, you know, being a good leader and having good character is being able to recognize your mistakes and addressing them and then moving on. And I think tomorrow you need to go back to that person and apologize and then let it go and move on. And when I, you know, she went into the house and, you know, I pray with her and she went into the house and I felt like the Lord was like, and that's for you, Noel. <laughs> because at times I'm like, I'm not a leader because I mess up because sometimes I don't trust and I pretend like I'm trusting, but really I'm not. And sometimes I can be, you know, cranky and sassy with the people I love. And sometimes I'm, I'm very judgmental secretly. Mm. And the Lord is just like, yeah, you are, but you're still a leader. A good leader though is going to say, Hey, I mess up. I'm sorry. I, I need to work on this. And then move forward in that yeah. grace and that forgiveness. But I, I do know that it's very hard to do that when you are in a position of leadership. You're afraid to let people know that you're messing up because you don't, it's not even your, it's not even always your pride. It's also that fear of like, will my mistake impact their spiritual yeah. development? Will it like send them the wrong way if I say, hey, you know, I struggle with this and, God is teaching me. It, it, there's so much wrapped up in it. And they're really, mm-hmm. it's, it's easy just to be like, well, I'll just con- you know, confess to people what's going on in your life. But there's, there's so much to that. And I think that is what creates this isolation for leaders is we can't really let people know because we don't really want anything bad to happen to them too. Yeah. It's not just us want to save face. It's like, okay, well, I said yes to leading these people spiritually. If I let them know that I'm not always spiritual, that's going to affect them spiritually. And so it's better if I hide and privately deal with this than to let others in. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult tension to live in. And yeah. I think that is where you have to continually go, it's, I'm the sheep. There's one good shepherd. But I'm a sheep that's that that knows where to get fed, mm-hmm. that knows where there's living water, and I'm gonna do my best. So it is hard. Yeah, it is yeah. hard. Mm. So you mentioned this this feeling of isolation that a lot of leaders experience, and like you said, knowing how much to share with people, oh. figuring out how to have healthy relationships with people, friendships. What? I don't, I'm curious if you have any of that figured out or if you have any <laughs> advice to leaders who are feeling that and in that tension of, yes. I don't know who to talk to. Mm. I don't know what to share. That This is my passion. This is what I like to talk about. So you just opened up a box for me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> My, that's okay. You, you who are listening, you know this is not a short podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, first I want to say, Jesus did not. You know, there's there's a thing that people say in church leadership and Christian leadership is that leadership is lonely. I just want you to know that is not how Jesus did things. In fact, in the very beginning of time, when he cre- when God created, you know, Adam, he said, "It's not good." For man to be alone. So yep. he created Eve. And, you know, obviously there's 
a lot of different, there's a framework of marriage there and partnership and stuff. But genuinely, I think the bottom line is it's not good to be alone in anything that you do. And then of course, Jesus, you know, he's born into community. He has a family. He grows up in a village. And then when he is you know, launching his ministry, so to speak, he invites people to walk with him in in his journey, the 12 disciples, and not just them, but others. Um, And he's God. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, he didn't have to do that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It might have been easier if he didn't. And so, you know, but even beyond that, one of the most powerful things for me is when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he turns to his disciples and he says, um, keep watch with me because my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. I mean, how vulnerable can you be? It's like, mm-hmm. I'm feeling so much sadness. I feel like I could die. I mean, he's God. And so, and he knew that they weren't going to be able to perfectly keep watch with him. And he still invited them because I think to his leaders were like, people are just going to hurt me. So I'm not going to invite them in. And Jesus knew these people are going to hurt me. They're going to, they're going to deny even knowing me. Um, They're going to completely betray me. And he was like, can he invite them in? And I think that really was to show like, we don't do this alone. It's not good to be alone, but there is this Harding to figure out, which is how much do you tell people? And that is very hard. And I think there's a couple different things that have to like change in our thinking with that. Because one thing I know is when I was interviewing, I did a survey about a year ago with a lot of women who either they were Christian leaders or their spouses were. Mm. And the big thing that they were most worried about was if I tell people what's going on, it's going to affect my husband or my children. It wasn't so much about them, the women. It was more like, and particularly their kids, they want to protect their kids. And as a mom, uh, I get that a hundred percent. Yeah. So there is a sense that you have to have wisdom. So do you tell your congregation when your kid is struggling with blank? That's something that you have to kind of talk about with your spouse, with your family and with the Lord. Yeah. I But I do feel like you have to talk to someone about that. And the way I think church particularly set up now can be difficult because the only people we feel like we can possibly, it's okay to talk with are people who are above us, maybe in position level, but we don't want to tell them because we don't want them to have this bad, that we don't want them to go, oh, they're having some problems. Yeah. So maybe we need to find somebody else. So it's very difficult. And then the other issue that we're having right now, particularly in westernized church culture, is it's difficult to make relationships with other leaders for two reasons. One, we're really busy doing the ministry work. So what, where's the time to connect with people regularly? You know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone's just busy trying to yeah. keep going. The second thing is I do think we do struggle with this silent comparison and competitiveness And that was the other thing that came up in my survey was women felt like they couldn't really connect with other pastors' wives or other female Christian leaders because they felt like they were being sized up or they were kind of like, oh, so how big is your church and how many came to your women's conference? It was like this Mm. weird, no one talks about it out loud. If you've ever been to a conference or some sort of networking event, you may know what I'm talking about. It's like everyone's very fake encouraging there for each other, but it's not like a real, it kind of feels like you're finding out how everybody else is doing so you can measure how you're doing. (laughs) And I think that's what is, is a problem with isolation. It's like, we're building little empires. We're not really building the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I say that to myself. Yeah. And so you have to really, if you want to find true friendship, you have to be vulnerable and you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I have done as far as looking for someone I can share with is I don't look to, for somebody that looks successful in ministry. I look for someone who looks sane and is just, you know, real and honest yeah. and and they look like they're regularly cultivating joy and peace in their life. And I go, literally, I mean, my friends can testify to this. I will go to them and be like, can I be friends with you? 
<laughs> and I mean, my I, this is so true. I've done that before. Yeah. I've been like, can I just like be in your life? Mm-hmm. And I m- make it a point to spend time with them. Yeah. And I that's because that is that time is the, the currency that we deal with trust. You cannot just trust somebody off the top. Of, you just, that's, that's weird. You shouldn't. You, know? <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> right. But the more you spend time with them, the more you're going to have trust with them. And, you know, my friend Lori, I mean, I talk about her in Northern Ireland, that American missionary, we lived around the corner. So we saw each other regularly. I mean, sometimes yeah. daily. And, you know, after a couple of months of seeing each other daily, I could say, hey, Troy and I are like, we're, we're having a really hard time right now. We're not connecting. I think we're too busy. This is going on. It's kind of creating weird pressure. Can you pray for us? Or can you, you know, mm. just need someone to know that. Yeah. So that's where I think as Christian leaders, we have to say, okay, who looks sane? Who is, who can I regularly spend time with? And, and, and who can I trust? And then just slowly be more and more vulnerable. Yep. There's this term that I've heard. I don't know if if you've heard it before, but it's this term called bleed up, which means like you shouldn't let your pain go down to your congregation. If people are leading, you need to bleed up. Mm. And I found that very hard because um, first of all, no one can bleed up. But <laughs> second of all, finding those people who are over you, it's just, it cannot feel authentic sometimes. Yeah. So I just, I say, do what Jesus did and bleed out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who who is next to you that you can reach out to and regularly make the time to develop that relationship? Because friendship is really about consistency and who you can regularly connect to. And eventually that trust should come and you develop this history with somebody. So, you know, that's what I encourage people to do. It's not easy though, when you're in ministry, I think it's a very unique thing, but for me, I don't have a ton of, I don't have a ton of really close friends, but I have a few and those are the ones I'm regularly in contact with. And I open myself to them and I'm very honest at the same time too. I want to say when there has been times in my life that there's been a crisis or something or just things were going on. The one thing I've learned when you're dealing with as a leader and there's people you're leading and how do you like manage what do they know, what they don't know, I'm I'm just going to offer a little free piece of advice that (laughs) you can take or leave it. I think when crisis happens and it's kind of like evident that you need to deal with it, Mm. when you conceal the matter, it kind of breeds confusion because people will fill in that blank with something really negative. Absolutely. They'll do like they'll they'll pick the worst thing and they'll fill that in and they'll communicate it. And that's just human nature because we're sinful. That's how we work, right? Yeah. I think when you communicate appropriately what is going on, it breeds compassion. And even personally, when I started to have the depression and the anxiety and it became evident that I had to deal with it, when I communicated that to the the people around me that I was leading, even my youth students, it they were so compassionate towards me. They 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 could my community surprise could handle it. Yeah, and r- rallied around me. I have walked with people with people who some serious crisis stuff in ministry, and they concealed it because you know they wanted to protect their family or they weren't sure how people would take it, and it does breed a lot of confusion and the community can't offer compassion because they don't really know what they're offering it, what they're needing to kind of direct that compassion towards. And so there's a lot of confusion Yeah, and I think it's a missed opportunity. And I, I think if you can get some wise counsel of how much to share, I think you're going to find a better healing journey. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to invite some more baggage. You got to sift through that's unnecessary. So that would be my encouragement. Mm-hmm. I've seen this, you know, I've seen this in certain crises where they have communicated, okay, there was a moral failure where this couple is stepping down because they're getting counseling and, you know, and the community just rallied and gave compassion and they, I mean, it was amazing. And then I've also seen them the opposite where it's concealed and people are going, oh, well, I heard this or I bet yeah. it was that. And then it's just like, it, it, it just actually creates a lot of chaos. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. And I think that that 
goes across the board for any sort of situation, especially Mm -hmm. in church communication, that anytime there is a lack of clarity, it's just an opportunity for gossip and for um, for misinformation to spread. Yeah. And when there's clarity and there's there's clear communication about the situation, regardless of whether it's you know somebody stepping down or whatever, it just is so much healthier <laughs> in in yeah. the environment of the church. Oh so. yeah, it's scary to do that. I mean, I want to recognize that. Too. Yeah, if you're in that to tell like a congregation something so private, your private pain is very scary. Yeah. And, um, but I wanted to say the, the alternative is might prolong your heal uh, or might delay your healing, so to yes. speak, because you have to deal with other things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned, you know, that even just going back to the friendship thing and, and having these relationships with other people, um, just even saying, Hey, will you be friends? Like it yeah. takes that, that question alone takes vulnerability, right? <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, my personality is a little kind of awkward. Like I'm a little <laughs> bit like kind of, so I get that. Yeah. Like one of my friends is like, you know, no, well, normal people don't do that, but I think anyone can invite anybody out for coffee. Yeah. It, it's a little scary because you're risking rejection. Yes. But I want to say, more often than not, you're probably not the only lonely person in the room. In fact, right now, I believe it's like one in four people in America do not have a person that they feel they can confide in. One in four, 25% of our population. So even think about that in your congregation or the organization you're leading. And think about that in, you know, your fellow ministry leaders that you're kind of colleagues with. Yeah. One in four of you feel like you got nobody. Chances are because of the, the uniqueness of ministry, it's probably much greater. Yeah. So to to say to somebody, hey, can like, you know, I connect with you. I like what you're, you know, there's something about you. I feel like we can connect on. Yeah. Do you have time? And then make the time. You got to make the time yeah. to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, he, I, I mean, I'm so just on board with everything you've talked about because I've seen it in all of my experience as well. And a lot of what I see is women wanting that relationship, wanting those friendships, but not being willing to actually do the work to yeah. develop them. And really it comes down to it's it's hard work. It takes vulnerability and it takes time, like you said, to develop. And like every person you go out to coffee with may not be a connection. It's almost yeah. like dating. If you yeah. go back to before you were married and you went out on dates with people, like not every date was a connection, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. And in like friendship, it doesn't happen at first sight. Right. You know what I mean, we talk about love at first sight. This, you know, that's not a real thing either, but yeah. definitely not friendship. And I think if you are lonely, and you need a friend, you're going to need to create space in your life for that. Some of us are just too busy, like bottom line, we're too busy, we're doing too much. Yeah. But if you're feeling lonely, you got to look at your schedule and go, what can be cut out? And also remember your, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health is also ministry work. Like, so mm-hmm. taking the time to meet somebody you know, who may be three hours away or something halfway once a month, you may go, I don't have time for that. You don't have time to not do that. So Mm. that's in your schedule. Like put that in, release any kind of guilt you have and go, well, that could be going to doing this project or this meeting. No, just that's part of it. And take that time to to cultivate that because you will need that, those relationships to to become the best you that you yeah. can be. God, we this is why we do community. This is like the whole reason why we're called to be together. We're the body. We come together and we make it, we, we function in this world, exemplifying Christ's love, but we can't be isolated from each other. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's hard. I think too, if you're in ministry and you got little kids, it's really hard because like, you know, you got no time. It's yeah. like no time yeah. at all. Yeah. But I think uh, more than ever, that's the time. Like make that your priority. If I can yeah. be so bold and bossy, if you got little, little guys and you're swimming with all this ministry work, I would just, my encouragement to you is your ministry right now is cultivating really deep, meaningful friendships. Mm-hmm. So you can be a good mom, you yeah. can be a good wife, you can be a good leader. 
And that's important. Yeah. So much of what I, (laughs) I preach myself. So I love, I love it. Well, I talk to other women sometimes and they're like, oh yeah, I can't, I can't make it out to Bible study. My kids are too little, or I can't do X, Y, Z. You know, I can't go on a weekend marriage retreat because I can't leave my kids. And I'm like, no, you gotta, you gotta do those things. If you want to sustain your, your healthy leadership and your life and your marriage for the long term. Oh, and here, this is so important what you just said, because (laughs) your kids are going to learn friendship from you. And if you're in ministry and you're feeling isolated, they're feeling it even more. Mm. And it gets worse as they get older because they're very cognizant that they are a reflection of you. People, you know, I don't know if you experienced this yet, but people might pull them aside and complain about you to your kids. I mean, people have stories like this, oh, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's so important that you are cultivating deep, meaningful friendships so that they learn that from you and they have that yeah. so that when they feel the pressure, if they're feeling like they're in the glass bowl, they actually have those things in place in their life too. I mean, So you've got to do it because if you're not doing it, guess what? They won't either, or they will find an unhealthy alternative to community um, because they'll need that release. So yeah, it's it's part of parenting too. So true. Yeah. I'm going to give everybody, I'm going to give you a chance to share with everybody, um, you know, how they can connect with you. But first, we always wrap up our conversation with this idea that leaders are learners And I love to hear Mm. something that you have been listening to or reading or just that God has been teaching you lately that you think um, the woman who's listening might, might benefit from. Oh my gosh. Which one do I pick? You can pick more than one. I love to listen to podcasts. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I love listening to podcasts. (laughs) I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I, I am totally into the Enneagram, of course. That's been very helpful. I'm sure you've talked about that on this. Yeah, for sure. But I have found that to be very helpful as being a ministry leader, for sure. I really have been, okay, this is going to sound crazy, but I, I've really been like studying a lot about C.S. Lewis's life. And mm-hmm. so I've just been like devouring anything and everything about him. I just find him really fascinating. And so I've been listening to podcasts about him and like watching documentaries and I just found him to be very interesting. And one of the things I found very interesting about him is his friendships that he had and um, with with the the famous one with J.R. Tolkien and a few others. Um, So I think he was really interesting because he was a leader. He wasn't traditional minister in the sense that he was ordained and all that stuff, but he really, I mean, I mean, gosh, just, (laughs) Such he a huge really influence. shaped a lot. Yes. And he was so creative and he was a storyteller, which I really relate to. So, you know, um, anything about C.S. Lewis or anything that he talks about, like I, I'm just into right now. Mm. And right now, actually, I'm just looking at the book, this little book here I've been reading, which is um, Readings for Meditation and Reflection by C.S. Lewis. Oh. Um, Walter Hooper edited it. And it's just like a little, like, just kind of like something I've been just into right now. So that's kind of it, but he was someone for sure. I felt like he, he also really was great at being honest about where he was, you know, Mm -hmm. he wrote, um, a grief observed and the problem of pain. And in those, he was very honest about his pain and his disappointment. And, uh, I, I feel like that's something as a leader, we have to learn how to communicate that even for ourselves to be able to express that. Yeah. So Mm. Anything C.S. Lewis is awesome. what I'm into right now. I love that. And we're going to put the the link at least to that book in the show notes for sure. So, mm-hmm. oh, Noelle, I just appreciate everything you've shared. And I know that for anyone in leadership, this hopefully this conversation has been encouraging and also a little bit challenging to just kind of push us out of our comfort zone to, to make those friends. Um, so can you tell everybody where to connect with you? What are the best ways for people if they want to just come and get to know you more and get more encouragement yeah. from you? I hang out on Instagram. Um, my handle is at your friend Noel. And I just invite any leader who's feeling lonely or weary or discouraged and you don't feel like you got anybody you could tell that to. I just want to give an open invitation. You feel, feel free to direct message me or uh, you can email me 
And I guess I'll put the email in the show notes, but yeah, um, yeah. the best place to email me is noelle at storyloud.com. And I really, you know, anybody, and I always say too, if you're in the North Jersey, New York City area, email me and I'll meet you for coffee yeah. and just um, be a listening ear. So mm. that's kind of where I'm at. And then, uh, I, you know, I, I produce a podcast show called Monday School, which is like a podcast devotional. So yeah. You can awesome. also listen to that and hear more stories about this. About my life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you guys are not subscribed to Noelle's show, you've, you've got to subscribe. I, I have found it to be so encouraging and just, um, you know, sometimes Sundays are a hard day for, for people in ministry. It's, it's not like a day of rest. It's kind of like a day of work. Yeah. <laughs> so I love Monday school. Cause it's like the day after the work day for many, mm-hmm. and it's just an encouraging uh, start to your week. So cool check that out and thank you everybody for taking a listen today and thank you again noelle for being part of this conversation today thanks for joining us on the christian woman leadership podcast if you enjoyed this episode would you consider leaving us a rating and review in your podcast app this helps more women just like you find the podcast and it also helps them to know whether the podcast would be a good fit for them just go to the show in your podcast app Then scroll down until you see the option for ratings and reviews. From there, you can tap to rate and write a review. It means the world to us when you take a couple minutes to do this. And thank you so much to everyone who has left a review. Now, don't forget, your leadership matters. And it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.